Hi everyone here and around the world. The cats are downstairs tonight. I had hoped I would be able to show them to all of you who love them and like to see them, but they will come jumping in here anyway as we go. And this is our spring equinox celebration for breaking through 200,000 subscribers on this live Earth Files YouTube channel broadcast. My dear brother, Jim, is back to pop the champagne cork for a toast to all of you with prayers for more peace and love and light on this precious planet Earth. And then I want to share with you my recent recorded interview with Luis Elizondo, former Pentagon Director of the Advanced Aerial Threat Identification Program, ATIP. Lou says only 5% of the UFO, UAP phenomena has been made public, leaving 95% still covered up by policies of denial. And what we're going to do now, Brad is going to come. Brad is the master of the computer, and he and my brother have been with me now through some of these champagne celebrations. And right now, my brother is going to open the champagne. If the pop uh, takes the cork out, uh, fine. Uh, we can catch it later, or he, he'll, he will catch it. Stand back. <laughs> and we are going to toast you guys. OK. Here we go. Ew, that was right. beautiful. beautiful. That was uh, beautiful. Got it. Here. All right. It's just like baptism. Baptism with the beautiful, exhilarating bubbles of champagne. Oh. <laughs> and may we, may we in this toast tonight as the champagne overflows, say to all of you in all of the countries who are with us tonight, please pray for peace on earth and pray for this planet turning to truth in all le levels, all layers, all subjects, including we are not alone in this universe. I love you guys. Cheers. Cheers. I love these guys. Okay, I'm going to run over here. Oh, that tastes so good. All right. That is wonderful. You did a great job. I love that sound of the champagne popping. And now, Ian, can you tell us what countries are tuned in to us tonight? Linda, congratulations. It's great to see you all tonight. We've got people tuning in tonight from all around the world. Earthfiles is now watched by 116 different countries around the world. And tonight, people are checking in from all over the United States, all over Europe, including Scotland, England. Uh, and we've also got our uh, viewers in Canada, Japan, Brazil, Sweden, New Zealand, Australia and South Africa. And we even have one viewer claiming to be in Antarctica. Well, I, I wonder who that is in Antarctica. <laughs> I've asked for some verification. I would love to know. Well, here, oh, Brad is asking me. He said that there was going to be some surprises 
and that I would have to put an earpiece in, and I've got it in now, Brad. Oh, Linda, 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 Linda. Ain't it fun? You are doing so well. It feels like I'm making one of these videos about every two weeks. Love it. Love it, my friend. Onward and upward, Linda Moulton Howe. Congratulations, Linda. I'm here with Bindi. She's a big fan of yours, very big fan, as you know. And we're celebrating 200,000 subscribers to Earthvile's YouTube channel. Congratulations. Thank you for reporting these great reports every week, Linda. We look forward to them. You are the reporter of the universe. Cheers, everyone. Oh. Oh, thank you, Whitley. Thank you, Serena. Oh, I love you guys. I really love you very, very much. And I now am going to pull a chair up for the official program. My dear brother is going to be sitting right here with us. Brad is going to be uh, behind the computer pulling levers. And we will go forward with gusto that it feels like that we have a growing, growing, growing space to talk about truth, and it's worth celebrating. Now, I'm going to bring my chair back up. And eventually, I'm sure the cats will be in here, for those of you who love to see Fluffy and chocolate. And which part? Oh, here. Okay. Here, you can put it right. It'll stay cold. It'll stay cold. I would love that to stay cold. Here, here, like that. Yay! I'm going to put that over it. Now, I want to give you some background about my special interview guest tonight, Louis Elizondo. Guess what happened is I'm missing a page. <laughs> he is a former U.S. Army counterintelligence special agent who served in the intelligence community and U.S. government, including the U.S. Army, for over 20 years, beginning in the mid-1990s. He ran military intelligence operations in Asia, South America, Afghanistan, and the Middle East. Previously, Lou's father, Louis Elizondo III, was a Cuban exile who volunteered to join a CIA-sponsored group formed in 1960 to attempt to overthrow Fidel Castro's Cuban government. That effort failed in the April 1961 Bay of Pigs. Forty years later, after the horror of 9-11, the younger Louis Elizondo ended up in the Middle East, where he served as advisor of an intelligence unit assigned to support General James Mattis during his command of a Marine Expeditionary Unit in the War on Terror. Later in 2017 to 2019, General Mattis was U.S. Secretary of Defense. Lou Elizondo supervised and conducted espionage and terrorism investigations around the world with a focus in the Middle East and Latin America. Then in 2008, Lou Elizondo was back in the United States in Washington, D.C., working at the Pentagon with the Advanced Aerospace Threat Identification Program also known as ATIP, becoming its director in 2010. He continued in that role until late 2017. Liu collaborated with the Office of the Undersecretary of Defense for Intelligence. It was a highly sensitive program funded through the work of the late Senate Majority Leader Harry Reid, a Democrat from Nevada. 
ATIP's mission was to investigate aerial phenomena, including unidentified aerial phenomena, or UAPs, and the potential threats they might pose to national security, also known since the 1940s as UFOs. Elizondo said he worked with officials from the U.S. Navy and the CIA out of his Pentagon office for ATIP until October of 2017, when he resigned to protest what he characterized as, quote, excessive secrecy, and internal opposition in the Defense Department. Next came to the STARS Academy, or TTSA, founded by rock singer Tom DeLonge with the goal to get UFOs and investigations of their advanced technologies out of Pentagon cover-ups into the white world where the public could finally be told, we are not alone in this universe. But TTSA disbanded three years later in 2020. Lou Elizondo left the company along with aerospace colleague Steve Justice from Lockheed and Chris Mellon, former Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense. By May 2021, Lou Elizondo was featured in a six, CBS 60 Minutes segment about UFO UAPs, which has had some 10 million views prior to a congressional ordered report from the Pentagon's Director of National Intelligence about UAP UFOs. The DNI admitted that 143 of 144 UFO cases seen by military pilots and crews since 2004 could not be explained. And significantly, the Pentagon report did not rule out extraterrestrial aliens. At that time, Lou Elizondo said publicly, quote, the American people now know a small portion of what I and my colleagues in the Pentagon have been privy to, that these UAPs are not secret United States technology that they do not seem to belong to any known allies or adversaries, and that our intelligence services have yet to identify a terrestrial explanation for these extraordinary vehicles, close quote. In September 2021, The Hollywood Reporter headlined, quote, former Pentagon UFO official Luis Elizondo to reveal shocking details in new book, that will have profound implications for humanity, close quote. Lou and his wife, Jennifer, married for 26 years and together for 29 years, have two beautiful daughters. They now live in Wyoming with four German shepherds that give them love and laughter. Last Saturday, March 19th, 2022, Lou and I recorded an interview for this Earth Files celebration beginning with his ATIP work in the Pentagon. Which one of your many investigations most convinced you that UAP UFOs are advanced non-human intelligences and technologies that interact with our planet, humans and animals? Linda, that's, that's a great question. First of all, thank you very much for having me and, and your wonderful audience. I'd also like to take just a moment to congratulate you. From my understanding, uh, Little Bird told me that you have now reached over 200,000 subscribers. Uh, so I know that is one heck of an achievement. So from, from my family to yours, uh, sincere congratulations. Also, I just wanted to take a brief moment. I have a, a one, as most people know, I live in the middle of nowhere, Wyoming. And even though our population density isn't very high, uh, you, you're kind of a, 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 a real <laughs> hero around these parts. My neighbor, Tim uh, is one of your subscribers, and he is absolutely giddy that you and I have a, a chance to talk. Um, really, really neat guy. and He just wanted me to, to say thank you for everything that you do and, and, and hello. So you've got thank a heck you. of a fan club out here. Thank um, you. Thank you. Yep. No worries. Well, well deserved on your part, for sure. Um, and as, and as thank far as the, you the, for your heroic work. Oh, uh, well, you know, look, Linda. I, I haven't been at this uh, nearly as long as you. And let's face it, um, we're only having this conversation because of pioneers such as yourself and, and a few other brave others 
that have been been championing this cause for for over 40 years. OK, so I I came in kind of at the tail end of this. Yeah, I, I was part of a tip and, and, and ran, you know, the government side of the house. But but this conversation has been going on a lot longer since, than, than my involvement. And I think it's it's fair to say that a, a lot, if not most of our success is really because of, of the courage of people like you who've been chipping away at this for for so long. Despite, Almost uh, half a century, Lou. <laughs> I, you know, and that's that's really remarkable, and, and it's paid off. I mean, look, as a journalist, did you ever think we'd be sitting here having this conversation where now the United States has law that we must report UFO information? And that's that's in large part because of the hard work that uh, folks like you and others have been doing for, for like you said, nearly fifty years. So, so my hats off to you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, no, we now, back to that question, uh, it, it really is focused around in all of that work that you did. Was there a case or a variety of something that really convinced you? And I understand that I'm making the assumption that you now have a conviction that we are dealing in UAP UFOs with something that is other than homo sapien. I think for me is when you when you have you have the eyewitness testimony of fighter pilots that is then backed up by the electro-optical data, or in this case, gun camera footage, which is then backed up by radar data. And they're all describing the same event at the same time, at the same place, under the same circumstances, and maneuvering in a way that is simply outside of the of, of our current understanding of, of physics and aerodynamics. That really causes you to pause, because what we're talking about is some sort of disruptive technology. And I don't mean disruptive in a negative way. What I mean disrupted by by a game-changing technology that is beyond next generation. Um, there is a natural arc to things when you talk about technological advancement, right? So in order, for example, to have uh, the, the, the supercomputer, you first need to invent the computer. Before you can invent the computer, you have to invent, you know, microchips and, and vacuum tubes and electricity. And there's a natural scale uh, for for technology to be to be eventually presented and used by by humans, and in this case, we're we're looking at technology that we're we're nowhere e even near any type of arc on on being able to understand some of this some of the the performance characteristics. So, let me put case in point. Let's take this little aircraft for exa for example. This little airplane here, this little model airplane. Um, flies and it flies because there's four fundamental forces. You have thrust, lift, drag, and weight. And when you understand those forces, you can create a lifting body and fly. But there's really only a few ways we know how to fly and through physics. And one is through through actual flight. Another one is through and that buoyancy. takes wings. Takes wings, correct? You have to have a lifting body. You have to create right. basically a low pressure over the wing and a high pressure underneath, which creates lift. Um, another way to fly is through buoyancy. So think about hot air balloon, lighter than air, where the density inside that cavity is less than the density outside. Right. And so very much like oil to water, it tends to rise. And then another way is just sheer ballistics. Think about throwing a baseball in the air with your arm. Um, you can throw it with enough energy where force equals mass times acceleration. It'll go up and then eventually come back down. But there's really only three fundamental ways we know how to defy the natural effects of Earth's gravity. What we are witnessing are objects that can fly, if you will, but without the associated technologies. No wings, no obvious signs of propulsion or thrust, not even a cockpit, no rivets, nothing, not not, not ailerons and, and rudders and control surfaces that we associate for, for maneuvering. Um, and yet these things are, are in our atmosphere. And furthermore, and you, you, they can travel at 12,000 miles an hour that we record and stop mid-air on a dime. There's one of the observables we had in the Pentagon was hypersonic velocity. And that is speeds that are characterized by Mach 5 or above, Mach right. being the speed of sound. That's very fast. Now, we do have aircraft can do it that can do it. So let's take this, this little mock up and let's say it's an SR-71. When I'm doing 3,200 miles an hour in the SR-71 and I want to take a right-hand turn, it takes me roughly half the state of Ohio to do it. Right. Yet what we are seeing is precisely what you just described, an object that is flying at not 3,200, but 8, 9, 10, 11, 12,000 miles an hour and able to do right angle turns, um, something that is, is well beyond any technology that we have. You're talking about extreme acceleration, 
hypersonic velocities, uh, and, and, and frankly, the ability to maybe operate in space as well and underwater. Right, and at those speeds, even up to 60 miles, where there should be some kind of evidence of the heat, that there is no trail, there's nothing associated with UFOs. I've heard pilots talk about that for years. How can something move fast, 90 degree, and leave absolutely no trace in the atmosphere up to 60 miles? We have something called signature data. And let's take this pen, let's say this pen was a ballistic missile. Um, anything that, that is moving in our atmosphere at a, at a particular velocity has a signature. Um, so you might express, for example, when you're seeing this rocket, you would see a contrail coming out the back. That is a that is a visual signature. That is that is vaporization and and vapor particles and and, and exhaust. You would also have, expect to see a heat signatures. So infrared, you'd see, for example, heat ablation off the front or friction. You could see the nose cone glowing, like you see when the space shuttle comes in. You can see the nose cone and the tail glowing because of, of heat uh, and the heat dissipation. You also have acoustic signatures like sonic booms, right? So when the space shuttle comes in and lands, you have that double sonic boom. Commander Steve Lindsay will take over the flight of the shuttle around this circle, which will set it up for final approach. Sonic booms now heard at the Kennedy Space Center are announcing Discovery's arrival. Three and a half minutes to touchdown. These are signatures, and then you have atmospheric ionization and whatnot. But you're absolutely correct. What we are seeing with these UAP, despite these incredible performance characteristics, we don't see any real associated signatures with them. And, and that for us is really perplexing because that means there is technology out there that can perform the ways that we are seeing it perform and yet not leave the, if you will, the, the, the signature, right, or the, or the fingerprint behind of that vehicle. And, and it, is, it is extremely perplexing because, let's, let's, let's face it, our taxpayer dollars spend billions, with a B, billions of dollars each year to make one single stealth aircraft, a B-2 bomber, for example. And that B-2 bomber isn't particularly invisible. It's just harder to see on radar, low observability, right? And we spend billions of dollars. Imagine if there was some sort of foreign adversary that had the technology to literally operate unimpeded in our controlled U.S. airspace without any associated signatures and not only hard to see on radar, but even hard to see with the naked eye, right? True stealth, true invisibility to, to some degree. Um, it would be a game changer. And so for reasons like that and many, many others, we're fairly convinced we're not, first of all, we know it's not our technology and we're fairly convinced it's not adversarial technology, which really leaves only one other option. It's someone or something else. And I have interviewed probably a dozen people who have worked in Minuteman missile launch control situations, either as officers or support. And they have been 60 feet underground at various missile sites that have ranged, let's say, in the United States from uh, the Minuteman uh, at Malmstrom Air Force Base in Great Falls, Montana, to Ellsworth Air Force Base in South Dakota, to F.E. Warren in Cheyenne, Wyoming, and beyond. And that is when UFOs have interfered with nuclear missiles, which would be our most sensitive uh, defense technology. Now, back in March of 1967, we're in speaking on March 19th of 2022, the Strategic Air Command, it made it to a, a piece of paper that has gone through history, and we have it today, that the uh, Strategic Air Command reported on March 17th, 1967, that, quote, all 10 missiles in echo flight at Malmstrom Air Force Base lost strategic alert within 10 seconds of each other. That uh, the fact that no apparent reason for the loss of 10 missiles can be readily identified is cause for grave concern to this SAC headquarters, close quote. One week later, on March 24, 1967, Air Force Captain Robert Salas was the launch control officer underground at Oscar flight at Malmstrom. Bob told me an above-ground security guard phoned him to say that a large red 
glowing UFO was hovering right over the Oscar Launch Control Facility security gate. And suddenly, 10 missiles dropped off alert status, one every second. That's steam engine, steam engine, steam engine, that a missile is going down every second. And incredibly, he learned that the exact same thing had happened one week before on March 16, 1967, at Echo Flight that was also at Malmstrom. But he, being a captain and being a launch officer, knew nothing about the March 16th event. It was completely squashed, and then it happened to him. He put me in touch with a Boeing engineer who told me, quote, this is from my own notes in the 90s, talking with a Boeing engineer who was sent to uh, Malmstrom and to investigate Oscar and Echo flights. Quote, Linda, it was impossible for those 10 missiles in two different flights to go offline one by one every second like they did. Impossible. But it happened. And the cause was apparently UFOs that we don't understand and we cannot control, close quote. Lou, there have been dozens of military eyewitnesses, such as Captain Salas, talking about UFO intrusions in our nuclear missile sites since the 1960s, maybe even the end of the 1950s. But the world has not fallen apart by those people speaking up. So why do you think that our government and other governments have classified almost everything about UFOs and ETs since World War II 70 years ago? Well, in, in national security, there is perhaps one of the greatest fears that we could ever have in the world of national security is a vulnerability. And that is an Achilles heel, if you will, uh, of our national security apparatus. And especially when you're talking about nuclear weapons, that is the part of the nuclear triad is really the crown jewels of our country. That is the one thing that in, in some people argue, you know, obviously it's a terrible technology. Other people argue it's the only thing that's been keeping the peace for this long because it's assured mutual destruction. Anytime there's a perceived vulnerability in our national security structure, in this case, our nuclear readiness, the government is going to be very, very, very loath to acknowledge that publicly because you're broadcasting to the enemy that, hey, look, if this can happen with UFOs, maybe Russia has the ability to do it as well, and we don't want to let Russia know that. So there is there is a, a, a huge concern to ever discuss any type of vulnerability we have. But you know what, Linda, you're absolutely right, and I know it for a fact because I've seen the intelligence reporting on the Maelstrom incident. But, you know, equally concerning is that even some people may argue, well, they turned them offline. They're showing that, you know, nuclear weapons aren't very, very useful for mankind. And yet in Russia, the exact opposite happened. In fact, there was an event where these nuclear weapons were actually brought online. So imagine how scary that is. Um, right. Now you have a, a potential runaway freight train and, and the start of World War III potentially. So and then there's a I'll give you I'll share with you. I've never shared this publicly uh, and I want to be very careful not to go into too much detail. But there is allegedly we're tracking this down. There was an incident involving a U.S. nuclear aircraft carrier in the early 70s. I won't say which one that encountered a UFO and it brought the entire aircraft carrier offline for a, for a while. Um, so, and this was a nuclear powered aircraft carrier. So it's, it's a big deal. And yes, you're right. We are seeing interference and interest, whatever interest it may be by these UAPs around nuclear technologies. There's a book written by Robert Hastings it's about the relationship the United States and the world has had with nuclear technology and the UAP phenomenon. It's, it's very compelling. And by the way, it's very accurate. So um, you're right. There, there's a connection. We are aware of it in, in the national security arena. I think that's probably why Congress is taking this so seriously uh, to some degree be, because of that connection. And Lou, I would like to reference what I think is the most important seven hour discussion I've ever had with anybody who worked for the United States government. I got to see some of his identifications. He sought me out. That's how I came to have this discussion. He worked for the Defense Intelligence Agency, one of your areas. And 
he had a close colleague in the World Bank. It was the individual in the World Bank who knew me from conferences and kept up with me with telephones. I always wondered if the man in the World Bank also worked for an intelligence agency because I've come to understand that there is a kind of marriage often between Intel and the barter system of the planet. And you can keep track of a lot of things by having people doing double duty in something like the World Bank or the IMF and Intel. So think of this as the man had worked for 23 years for the DIA and was retiring, as I was told. That was the context. And when he began, Linda, for the last 23 years, my job has been to monitor and analyze the conflict of three competing extraterrestrial civilizations on this planet. And our government has proof that they have been here in competition for at least 270 million years. And when I asked him what the proof was, he said it would be too dangerous for me to tell you. It would be dangerous for you and it would be dangerous for me. And I've never had a complete answer. We are dealing with technologies that include temporal technology that can manipulate timelines and that the manipulation of timelines like the manipulation of atoms are both equally dangerous. And we humans have nothing that can compete. However, he and the current source said, we do have advanced intelligences who have a vested interest in us, in humans being able to survive on this planet, and some of them are very strict, and they will not, under any circumstances, allow us to use nuclear weapons because, and this is another quote, when we let off atomic bombs in World War II, we were tearing into dimensions we knew nothing about, and we are now dealing with advanced intelligences who not only understand other dimensions, they can move and pop in other dimensions, which is part of what they appear to us to pop in and out of our reality. If you've been exposed to any of this, please say so. And if you can't, I have done the bridge <laughs> to what I think is the part of the reason that it doesn't matter who you are on Earth who is human that what we are in the context of describing is mind-boggling at, at many levels, and that we cannot begin to move forward on the planet until all of the governments and all of the people who are interacting directly with non-humans, as I understand, tell the whole planet, and we all need to be educated about subjects that we've never even been exposed to. And the sooner, the better. Because I think that what we humans are doing on the Earth is considered a threat to what they consider to be the higher priority than Homo sapiens sapien. And that is saving the precious laboratory that Earth has been for millions and millions of years to other intelligences. Wow, that's a lot to unpack there, Linda. Uh, very thoughtful. Let me let me start with my, if I can, recapture the three premises that we you just had mentioned. One is is the notion that time is nonlinear. Two is that nuclear weapons uh, and and their use uh, is in some way forbidden or verboten. And the last is um, some sort of intention to either interfere or manipulate, not necessarily a bad way, human evolution. And so let's start with the nuclear weapons premise, if I may. Um, I think we all agree that the use of a nuclear weapon is, is a terrible thing. It's not even a last resort. We should never even resort to it at all. However, um, my concern with your source saying that we, under any circumstance, can't use nuclear weapons uh, doesn't hold up to the, the fact that in World War II, of course, we use them. 
We also use them for testing uh, throughout the 50s, 60s, and even early 70s. We did test a lot of yeah. nuclear weapons. Well, Good and then point. Then you have recently, you also have North Korea recently testing them. You have India and Pakistan testing them this this just this last this century the 2020 so so nowhere did we see uap or ufos interfere or stop that and 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 that testing continues unfortunately so so it for me it's very hard for someone to say under no circumstances we'll be allowed to use them because we continue to use them on a fairly routine basis globally and again i'm not saying that's an excuse that we should we shouldn't but but the fact is that we do, and we haven't seen UFOs. Maybe the distinction is war would be a heavy use. Maybe testing is less and more controllable. Well, maybe, but but still, if, if someone is saying that you're ripping a hole into a dimension, then it shouldn't really matter. I would, I would submit to you that probably it's, it's you know, we've, we've, we've tested them and along with Russians in space. We've tested them on the ground, underground. We continue to do so, and so do other countries. Um, I, I do think that um, there is a connection. We do know that for sure, uh, because we've even been anecdotally, there's been reported UAP incidents even around Fukushima and but potentially even Chernobyl. So so uh, and then even here in the United States, we have absolute reported government reporting around some of our our interesting facilities around here to include Oak Ridge National Laboratory. Uh, and some other more sensitive facilities that I can't mention here. So so I do think there's absolutely nuclear connection and interest. Um, your second piece you can talk about time being, you know, we being linear for us as humans, but that there may be another species that experiences time where you can manipulate it almost like space, right? It's, there's more dimensions. Exactly. As we know to space, you, there's three dimensions to space. There's an X, Y, Z axis, and perhaps time is the same way. And there are some models in quantum mechanics that do to some degree, substantiate the fact that time at the very, very small level, kind of the notion of time breaks down. Um, it, it becomes nonsensical. And so one of the examples is using the, the electron. As kids, you learn, at least of my generation, we learned that the electron orbits the nucleus of an atom. We now realize that's flawed. That's not the really way a, 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 an electron works. It's in all points at once. <laughs> Absolutely. It's, it's there and it's not all at the same time. And so uh, time, you know, when you get down to that level, really starts to, to, to break down. And is it possible that if an electron can experience time multidimensionally, that other things can too? Well, potentially that is true. Yeah, it, it, that may be very well be the case. We don't know, but there, the, the science and the mathematics does suggest that time itself is not, not linear the way that we experience time. Uh, and then the last thing here is, is it possible that there is some, um, a species that has been, uh, if you will, actively interested in, in, in human development. Now, 250 million years ago is an awful long time. Most of us were simple organisms, either living in an ocean or probably squirming, sliming around the, the beach somewhere. Um, but the complex mammals that we see today uh, were, were really not there. It was, mostly it was 270 TV. million is what he used. Yeah, that's right. That's an awful long time. Now, it doesn't mean that something wasn't still interested in, in Earth and our biome, right? Because we know we are interested in all the biomes on Earth as, 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 as a as Yeah, a species. the implication was not that humanity, even humanoids, which did not come into play until 2 million years ago in Homo erectus and evolution. No, he was talking about that there had been active genetic manipulation in Earth by three conflicting species ah. using Earth like a laboratory. And look gotcha. at how long dinosaurs dominated on the Earth without uh, what we would say the flora and fauna of today. So it was the emphasis was three competing extraterrestrial civilizations using Earth as a laboratory to make all kinds of genetic experiments. Sure. Well, we, we do know that Earth is very unique compared to the other planets in our solar system because here life is abundant. That's not to say life won't be found in, in other, forgive me, parts of our solar system, but, but for Earth, it is chock full of life. In fact, it's, there's life at the very large, the very small, um, and it's super, super diverse. When you take a human being and compare it, let's say, to a, a house plant, right? They couldn't look and, and behave any differently, yet our 
parts of, of life forms, parts of certain kingdoms of life here on this planet. And they and they they compete for resources and they need food and they need water and they replicate. They do a lot, we do a, we do a lot of same things out of banana dust, believe it or not. So and there's a lot in common we have genetically with with other life forms on this planet. So Earth is definitely an interesting laboratory. Um, it is it is it is a place where you could, if, in essence, monkey around with genetics and then just watch it go and see what happens over a long period of time. And Lou, here is a perfect place to remind the audience that it was April 9th, 1983, when I was working on a documentary for Home Box Office called UFOs, The ET Factor, that uh, I was shown a document here at Kirtland Air Force Base in Albuquerque in a meeting that was set up for me uh, by uh, Peter Gerson, who was representing Citizens Against UFO Secrecy, to talk with AFOSI agent Richard Doty about um, the whole UFO subject starting and beginning for this HBO uh, documentary. And he, at, instead of discussing something that had happened at Ellsworth Air Force Base, he said, my, and these were his exact words that I remember, my superior authority has requested that I show you this. And he opened up a drawer and took out a manila envelope and pulled out some white typing sized pages. And he said, you can read this, you cannot take notes, and I want you to move from the chair you're in to one in the middle. And I was so green at the time that it never occurred to me that I was being moved because they had cameras that were going to record. I've heard people who have watched these videos. Um, and as I read, one, there were two paragraphs with sentences that I've never forgotten. These extraterrestrial biological entities manipulated DNA in already evolving primates to create Homo sapien, and the Latin Homo sapien was used. Another sentence, all questions and mysteries about the evolution of Homo sapien on this planet have been answered, and this project is closed. And I remember that my mind was stunned and was rereading those sentences. And that was in 1983. A DIA guy in 1999 gives me more versions, a current person. And Lou, it seems to me that this is one of the biggest enchiladas that political forces and governments decided in World War II if they were learning this in pieces that they thought that human beings could not handle being told we are a product of genetic manipulation on this planet that is going on throughout this universe. But in denying us as humanity the truth, I think it has weakened us. And today we are in a, like we're in a Chinese torture. We need everybody to know the truth. And yet, we still have policies, we still have people that are infighting internecine warfare, trying to keep everybody in the dark while we are evolving. And it's my understanding from the source in the past two years that we do have space forces working with some ETs on 22 solar systems at this end of the Milky Way galaxy. Can I prove that? No, but I can say this as an investigative reporter after nearly half a century, that I think that the people who have been telling me we have been going into other solar systems since 1972, three years after the landing of Apollo, in which uh, the, the great scene of getting out with Armstrong onto the moon. And and I think I'm saying all this to you because the disconnect between what is really happening by a tiny fraction of human beings in power broking control with non-humans versus what we are being told on the earth, it is so huge 
isn't it at this point a possible threat to our security that the disconnect between truth and what we're told as policies of lies and denial is so great? Wow, again, a lot to unpack here. Really, really, I think, thoughtful questions, Linda. Um, let me see if I can start with uh, the first, my, my first statement would be the truth is always better than, than anything else. Um, I, I think we as a species deserve the truth, no matter what that truth is. And it's the reason why I've committed to do what I do. Um, I think as an intelligence, former intelligence official, for me, I really adhere to the old adage and the truth shall set you free. Um, and and I do believe the truth, whether it's good news or bad news, should always be um, be a primary motivation, and especially when you're dealing with your own, when your own people, you're talking to your own citizens. We have a moral obligation to always tell the truth to ourselves. Two, um, you talk about a little bit about um, the uh, allegations since 1972. We may have had extra solar system travel. Um, when we went to the moon, we were using conventional technology. We were using basically uh, uh, chemical rocket motors in order to 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 send us to the moon. Uh, very much as we talked about at the beginning of this conversation, force equals mass times acceleration, ballistics, right? So put enough energy behind something and it's going to take off and, and you can eventually even get it to the moon. Um, but if we were able successfully to travel outside the solar system in 1972, I'm, I'm almost 100 percent positive we would have to be using some sort of technology other than conventional technology like we've been seeing most recently. Even the mirror taking people to the ISS uh, is, is still done in, in the same way we've been doing it since the 1960s. Right. I understand by so many people who are in authority today, who are in agencies to me, that I have to assume that they are not lying about a relationship that has been developing between non-humans and at least our government, and I assume other governments, in bits and pieces over the 20th to the 21st century, whether it began in any kind of formal treaty way in World War II with the alleged treaty that Eisenhower may have signed with some one of these, we, all of us, need the documents. We need the proof. I understand that. If everything that the DIA agent told me and the current has told me, the issue of are we still, are we still someone's genetic manipulation experiment, and do experiments have beginning and ends? Well, I think you bring up a really good point as far as, you know, my, my background before I ever joined the government was, uh, I went to school to, to, to be microbiologist and immunologist with, with some work in parasitology, not parapsychology, parasitology, the study of right. parasites. Parasite. Microorganisms. Yeah. Right, parasites. So my, and my minors were, were mathematics and chemistry. Uh, you know, the genet genetics is something that is has always been on the forefront of science um, ever since uh, we we first really unlocked the secrets of DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid. And in the 80s, we were still somewhat in the infancy of uh, we hadn't mapped the genetic human genetic genome yet. We really didn't understand a lot of what we consider genetic junk to be. Turns out really isn't junk That's at all. It's right. actually very, very important. And I think, you know, genes, when you look at gene sequencing, if you ever get into a class of virology and see how viruses work, you can see where mutations occur. Um, you know, to some degree, genetics is like a it's like a digital roadmap. You know, when you're talking DNA, what is it? Well, you have adenine, guanine, cytosine, and tyrosine, AGTC. And those are the genetic codes that, that make up the DNA. Uh, and why that is important is because you can actually look at it and see where mutations occur temporally. You can see where, for example, a, a particular group of humans started to develop a certain type of disease. You can find that in the genetics. And so genetic manipulation, whenever it occurs, whether it's through Mother Nature or because of, of just natural mutations, or there is some sort of mutation due to an environmental 
perspective or a technology, for example, radiation after Hiroshima and Nagasaki, as, as awful and terrible as it was, there was a lot learned afterwards, several generations watching the exposure that that high amounts of radiation has on the human genome. It, and it's Lou, you're making such an excellent point that would explain that last sentence in that briefing paper that I read here at Kirtland in a way, because it was so shocking. All questions and mysteries about the evolution of Homo sapien on this planet have been answered and this project is closed. What else could any of us who have, uh, who have some education in science, what else could we conclude but that at a genetic level that there was something in the DNA, the RNA, that matched something our government was already retrieving, which were craft and bodies, even if the bodies were gray androids. They were made by something that made some of them biological. Others, I now understand, were printed, just like we print now in this printing technology where you can go to Mars and the moon and you can print out what you want to do and assemble it, that some of the grays are exactly that and some are biological and that the other beings are also biological. So the fact that there, if the briefing paper was an insight into a truth, our government knew that we were the product of genetic manipulation by non-human. Right now, the, what is absolutely for certain, and is now law, historic for the first time ever in our nation's history, is that biological effects are now part of this conversation. Meaning, if a U.S. service member or a, a, somebody gets into contact with um, a UAP, and there are, we need to study, are there negative biological consequences that can be measured. That includes, by the way, genetics, right? So it's, it's, if someone receives a radiation burn because they happen to come too close and up personal with the UAP, is there a, is there also some sort of damage genetically? Now we know there were studies that we did through OSAP and ATIP in the early days that looked at the potential for there to be some sort of genetic mutation, uh, on individuals who came too close to this type of advanced technology, um, whether it, because we did see that you know if you if you come up to a certain point, there were these superficial burns that looked like radiation burns. If you got a little closer, there was internal organ damage and and potentially some genetic mutation occurring. Yeah, right at my next question, and I only <laughs> I only want to uh, insert just right now because this is exactly where I was going next that uh, that. We knew that we've gone through those five observables about the craft, but the, uh, now a sixth and a, possibly a seventh are impacts, biological effects of UFO UAPs on humans, and you can add on technology such as car batteries and lights. So that would be seven. Well, right. in December of 2000, this is 2022, this is 22 years ago, in December of 2000, the UK Defense Intelligence Analysis staff produced a highly classified, secret, UK eyes only two volume report entitled Unidentified Aerial Phenomena in the UK Air Defense Region, Scientific and Technical Memorandum Number 55 slash 2 slash double zero. On page F4, Frank dash 4, that's Annex F. Volume 2, pages 16 through 30, under a section entitled Potential Mental Effects on Humans. It states, quote, the well-reported Rendlesham Forest Bentwaters event in England, that was December 26 to 28, 1980, is an example where it might be postulated that several observers were probably exposed to UAP radiation for longer than normal UAP sighting periods, which means that the, probably the UFO was interacting with the human and keeping the human there. There may be other cases which remain unreported. It is clear that the recipients of these effects are not aware that their behavior perception of what they are observing is being modified. 
The E field strengths, which are known to affect the brain, the human brain, are of the order of 50 multivolts per centimeter at between 1 and 100 megahertz. And experiments have shown that effect can be produced at several levels. Then paragraph 15 of the MOD report states, quote, it is concluded, therefore, that if some UAPs, as is believed and correlated by actual reports, such as car electrical equipment failing in their presence, that there is a production of EM radiation, and there is a high probability that the UFO UAP can affect the human brain, close quote. That's, again, very, very thoughtful, uh, I think, um, uh, topic you bring up. Um, let's, let's, first of all, let's discuss what is the human brain. Well, the human brain, we know, is, is, is an amalgamation mostly of water and, and electrical contacts, right? Electrical connections through, through neurons, biological and electrical connections, uh, nerves. And so uh, water, we know, if a simple water you can put in a microwave. And with simple microwave radiation, heat it up. And how are you heating it up? Well, it's not that the microwave is actually heating anything up. What happens is that the microwave interacts with the H2O molecules and shifts them back and forth very rapidly, creating friction, heat. Uh, and with and calcium ions that allow us to have a nervous system. And if right, they right. are so, affected, yeah. Yeah, my, my point being is that the human brain really isn't much different than, than a computer chip, really. And we know that you can fry a computer chip with all sorts of types of radiation. Uh, in fact, there's there's electronic warfare. I got to be careful what I say here, but but there's a whole area of warfare dedicated to conducting warfare via electromagnetic emissions uh, and also collecting data via that as well. So, so it's not at all surprising to me that uh, the human, the, if you will, the human organism, if it gets too close to something, can absolutely experience adverse biological consequences. Now, here's the interesting part. There is also some preliminary data to suggest that some, some individu individuals actually report the opposite. So rather than having some sort of negative biological consequence, all of a sudden you have somebody who's now, for example, a piano virtuoso who's never sat in front of a piano before or who now becomes suddenly super artistic or who claims to have some sort of extrasensory capabilities or talents now, right. if you will, or a sixth sense, whereas before they didn't. Um, and I find that even even more interesting. Uh, I shouldn't say that, not more, uh, equally interesting as the, as a negative consequences. But your point is very well taken. Look, the, the human brain, the human organism, isn't a whole lot different than anything else in nature. And if you put, you know, if you can fry a car battery, with technology, then chances are you can also, I hate to say it, but fry a human brain too. Uh, and you can do other things. We have, in fact, if you ever talk to John Alexander, former Colonel Special Forces, wonderful human being, this is a person who spent a lot of his time researching, quote unquote, non-lethal technologies right. for the U.S. government. Now, what is a non-lethal technology? Well, it's using non-lethal method, methods to, to get a human being to do something that they wouldn't normally do. One of those technologies that was explored was trying to convince, for example, an angry riot or an angry mob to become super passive and, and, and lay down any type of, of potential weapons they may have through literally, um, in very crude sense, scrambling the, the, the brain waves in the human brain. Imagine setting up an emitter that can send out an invisible uh, frequency and, and cause human beings to do certain things and behave a certain way that they wouldn't normally do. Russians uh, did a lot of this experimenting in the 60s with their psychotronic weapons development program. So it's, it's certainly not outside the realm of possibility that, that people can be manipulated, people can, can, can have their, their, their brains, if you will, interfered with by UAP technology. I don't think that's a big leap at all. What do you think is the biggest reason for why our government and other governments are still maintaining policies of lies and denial about this oh huge, goodness. huge phenomenon that has been interacting with our planet? 
for yeah. so long and affects us and we need the truth. Sure. Well, if anyone in your audience right now has children that are listening, um, I'll give you a second to cover their ears. Okay. Now that the ears are covered, why do we still tell our kids about uh, Santa Claus, right? And why do we still tell our kids about the Easter Bunny and Tooth Fairy, right? Um, okay. Now, if you have kids, they can take their ears off. Uh, take the, you know, <laughs> um, we do that as parents because we 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 want to elicit certain behaviors from our children. Okay. Well, governments, religions, institutions, they're no different, okay? Um, they, they do things and say things uh, because it serves a purpose at the time. I don't think when you have a, a government that's faced with the reality that, okay, UAPs are real, which I think we're there now, the questions now, you have, to, you have to unwind 70 years worth of yarn, of tangled lies. Yeah. Uh, we belittled people. We told people they were crazy. People lost their jobs. Some people lost their marriages. Some people lost their livelihoods, all for doing the right thing. Imagine now having to go back to a pilot who's now living on the streets after 30 years, lost everything and say, you know what? You were right. You reported a UFO and you got punished for it. And at the end of the day, you were right. And you did the right thing, you know, and you lost everything because of it. Um, that's, that's, that's an issue. Plus you have the, 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 the large military industrial complex, uh, which, you know, in some cases, can you imagine having two companies, company A and company B? Company A happens to get an unfair advantage and get some material to analyze while company B doesn't. Company A now wins a lot of contracts. Company B goes bankrupt. 200 people now no longer have jobs. You know, that's there's a problem with that because co one company got a fair an advantage and became a multi-billion dollar aerospace company, for example, while the other didn't, the other one went bankrupt and, and, and shareholders lost money and people lost jobs. So there's a there's a real legal issue there. And then there is, of course, the issue of having to go back and, and as, a, as a government say, you know what, you're right. We haven't been totally truthful with you. You know, our, our authority as a government is based on the people having faith and confidence in our government. And when you have to go back and unwind 70 years of tangled yarn, that doesn't help your credibility. Why can't the Secretary of Defense with the Secretary of State stand up in front of the world and say, we apologize, but there were good reasons in World War II? Yeah, well, and I, th I, think that's, I think we're getting there now, Linda. The problem is, is that, look, even the Secretary of Defense, they're a political appointee. These aren't, very few of them are actual warriors or have spent their time in the national security apparatus. They're, 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 they're political appointees. They're somebody who's been in favor of the current administration, whoever's in charge, whether it's conservative or liberal or anything in between. And these are people that are probably pretty good lawyers and they've, they've served on a political campaign, but, but they haven't really spent a lot of time in a leadership role or in intelligence or with the you know, as security clearance. Now some have, but, but they tend to be the exception and not the rule. So it's the same thing with presidents, right? A president is a, is a, is a politician. Very few of them are former military leaders, and a lot of them haven't been told the truth. And this is one of the reasons why I don't expect the Secretary of Defense to come out and say, yeah, Lou ran the program, Lou was this and Lou was that. They're not going to do it. They're, these are political appointees, and they've got a huge responsibility. I have seen the, uh, Senator Harry Reid, God bless him, uh, that he stood up as he should have for you, you were heading the advanced Amen. aerial Amen. Uh, threat identification program in the Pentagon. You were there for five years. And the very fact that you would end up being uh, attacked by people in the Pentagon today is oh, yeah. what were you told uh, the Hill in an article earlier uh, for 70 years since World War II, the U.S. government has been keeping UFOs in the halls of secrecy, and we haven't come any closer to figuring it out. So are we going to repeat the same mistake all over again, meaning you get attacked, the government pulls back, they come out with more policies of denial? Yeah. What do you think is realistic in 2022 about... Sure. Um, are being told the whole truth. We're not alone in this universe. It's preposterous that that was ever even accepted as a possibility. And do you think 
that the, at least that much, we're not alone in the universe. Maybe the Webb telescope is going to show us artificial structures, which it can, on uh, a, a planet orbiting the sun 4.2 light years from Earth, like Proxima Centauri. Webb will be able to show us artificial structures on a planet there. Would that be an intelligent way to finally open up, at least, even if it's looking backwards, into light and a telescope, there are structures, therefore there is intelligence in this universe. And ladies and gentlemen, we have a big story to tell you. I, that's certainly one way, you know, there's organizations right now like Galileo that are also doing the same thing. I think, I think this, this next year is, gonna, is very promising. Back to your point, um, here's, here's an example of why sometimes <laughs> the government doesn't necessarily learn its lessons very well. When I came out, uh, the press secretary, Dana White, already announced and acknowledged for the record that, yes, ATIP was real. It was looking at UFOs and, and Lou was part of it and was running it. It wasn't until after I left and then Secretary Mattis left that then they decided once you had a new secretary in that they started to change their position. And when they were called to the table on that and say, how do you explain that? Because we have evidence it was about UFOs, it was there, it was running it, this was facts. Um, then they, they started to dig themselves even deeper. So you started having FOIA requests about my background. Well, there is a court ordered preservation order in effect on my actual emails. Well, what did they do? They deleted, <laughs> deleted my emails in violation of a court order. In essence, they broke the law this topic is so is so sensitive for them that they were willing to break the law simply to cover their tracks, to say nothing to see here, folks, right? That that was a misstep by by the Department of Defense, by the new leadership that came in, because what they didn't realize is Congress already knew the truth. And Congress wasn't going to let them get away with that. Because Congress already had received the briefings. They knew the people from the inside. They had the documentation and, and, and whatnot. They knew exactly what we were doing and what the results were. So now the DOD is in a position where you have certain elements in there that are continuing to dig themselves a deeper and deeper hole, while others are saying, all right, guys, we, we got to stop. And we where really does have. Senator Gillibrand's uh, amendment in the Defense Authorization Act in December, as I understand it, there will be a permanent office in the Pentagon on UFOs. But, Lou, is it going to be an honest office? Well, we're, we're, we're trying to make sure that happens. You know, um, I, I still hold my security clearance and I, I'm still doing my very best to make sure that that this is done in, in the way that it should with lessons learned, with lessons we learned in ATIP and OSAP and other previous programs. Um, I think there is an honest attempt by Congress. In this case, you said Senator Gillibrand and, and Marco Rubio. Imagine that, right? Opposite ends of the aisles coming together on this topic. I think both should be commended tremendously. Yes. Um, those are exactly the type of leaders we need in Congress. You also have it on the House with Gallegos and Tim Burchette. Again, opposite end of the aisles coming together to push this forward. Um, I think I think it's definitely moving in the right direction. I think their staffs are committed. I've never seen this level of interest by, by the congressional staffs and even in, within elements of the U.S. government. And I even see to some degree a softening on some of the DOD's resistance, where now you have a DOD evaluation underway to try to evaluate what, how did we mess this up so bad. Uh, you have uh, a lot of these people being questioned now for their for their. Uh, by by the Senate for their confirmation in order to get the job, they have to answer questions about UAPs. You have the establishment of this permanent op office. Initially, I had some concerns, but there's been some indication recently that um, I think the leadership from my old office realizes that there were some bad actors in the in the mix and have now taken steps or are taking steps to put the right people in those positions to actually manage this correctly. Uh, it still remains to be seen if, if that level of commitment is there, but I, I think I think it's moving in the right direction. Uh, and so those voices of dissenting views and opposition that that have obviously made, tried to make my life miserable and, and, and miserable some other individuals, I think they're becoming a minority uh, as every day goes on, and they're beginning to find themselves backed into a corner with less and less of the support that they once enjoyed. And Lou, look, you've got. 
95% left to tell the world, right? If only 5% of the UAP UFO story has been put to the public, 95% yet to unfold. And one of the questions in that uh, next uh, step, what exactly is the Sky Fort? Oh, yeah, well, Sky Fort is, uh, is an organization that was created of like-minded individuals. Uh, again, very much like Congress, opposite ends of the social spectrum. Some are conservative, some are liberal, some are in the middle, uh, but all feel equally compelled um, to, to continue to have this conversation in an open form, uh, transparent form. And so Sky Fort was created in order to have that conversation, not only with the American people, but the world. And whether that's the media or it's social media or it's, you know, uh, mainstream media or it's Congress or whatever it may be, it's to try to have a conversation in an elevated way and continue to move the needle forward, move the discussion forward. Now, truth be told, some of the mission that we had set up for Skyfort has already been achieved and accomplished. Um, I, I don't think any of us expected four years ago that we would be here now with a law and a permanent organization and funding and a whole of government approach. It's no longer just DOD or the Intel community. It's now FAA and it's now DHS and it's also NOAA and it's all these other organizations, Department of Energy, that now are, are going to be required to work on this topic, right? It's the scientific and academic communities. We have this incredible international organization of, of people, this, this, this motley crew of folks that are working very hard behind the scenes to have this conversation in their own country. We have folks in the UK and in Canada and Australia, and, and they're just doing incredible work. It's, it's absolutely amazing to see what they've been able to achieve. You now have people in, in the Canadian Parliament coming out and saying, hey, we want answers. We want to know what the heck's going on. You have people now, ministers of parliament in, in the in the UK saying, hey, there may be something to see here, folks. We need to start asking the hard questions, right? In, in a way, it's like the sky fort. You guys are saying, we just can't wait for the official Pentagon Department of Defense standing up in front of satellites around the world in every time zone to say, uh, we're not alone, ladies and gentlemen, and we do have a lot to share. Yeah, and encouraging people to come out and know it's okay to have a conversation about this, to come out and say, you know what, I had my own experience. I think we achieved that. I think we've already had disclosure. If you look back, because here's look, you have two former directors of the Central Intelligence Agency from different administrations, different sides of the aisle. You have a former director of national intelligence, a sitting director of national intelligence. You have two former presidents of the United States that are still alive that have all come out and said, yes, this is real. I mean, had this been on any other topic, we are well beyond disclosure. We've passed the Rubicon. Now the question is, okay, what is it? How does it work? What are their intentions? Where are they from? What's going on? You know, that, of course, some may already know the real hard work begins. But I, I think we've already achieved disclosure. Capital D, we're there. We, we've already, all the people that we needed to say, yes, it's real, have already said it's real. So in fact, now we're spending actual taxpayer dollars on it. So yes, in your lifetime, you have went from it being being a, 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 a investigative a journalist on a topic that was once considered fringe to now being perhaps fundamentally one of the, the greatest topics this species has ever faced. And it's now legitimate and it's now real. And other people in mainstream media have, are now jumping on board realizing this is real. A tweet just went out yesterday from a very senior CNN reporter saying, hey, I think we need to spend more time talking about UFOs. So, so that's done. And, and so I think, I think you should probably give yourself a real pat on the back for that because that occurred in, to some degree because, you know, thanks because of the hard work you've done all these years. Thank you. Cattle mutilations and animal mutilations were a very difficult subject to touch in 1979, but it was the truth that work is the truth and opens up a whole other question that I understand governments and political people have a hard time saying the words, but it has to be a part of this evolving sky fort that we have to look at all of the facets. We have to learn about all of the background with other intelligences clearly from someplace else that are interacting. And Lou, I just wanted to ask one more question. You have been around the world. You have an incredible background in intel. Have you ever seen a UFO? 
until I have this conversation with you, I've always been very close hold on my own personal experiences. I will say simply put, yes. And hopefully in an upcoming interview at some point that you can tell me in full detail and we'll put it on the Earth Files YouTube channel. Dear Lou Elizondo and your family and your four beautiful German shepherds, my hug to you in the digital world as a fellow human being on a planet that is struggling so hard to move from being babies to teenagers to adults without war. Thank you for everything you have done. Thank you for being here today. I look forward to talking with you, I hope, more in the future. Absolutely, Linda, please allow me just a moment here to thank you and your wonderful audience. Thank you for the nearly 50 years of commitment to this topic. Thank you for sticking with it. Thank you for dealing with the negativity. I now think I've tasted a small sample of what you've had to endure. Yes. Uh, and I just want to say from the bottom of my heart, from my family, thank you for what you do. And thank you to your lovely audience for, for allowing me to be part of this conversation with you today. And now let's go to Ian for Super Chats. Thank you, Linda. Here we go. Moonbird, Zeal Bella, XWSE 534S. Deborah Guy, Laurie, uh, Laurie Tavares, Michael Texera, transgressive chemist from Princeton, Linda Emeterio, Angela McQueen, Isabella Passini Perkins, Heather Gray, Fernando Menezes from Brazil, Jessica Rodriguez, Liz Gasperi, Stephen Adamski, Rat Generation X, 1972, Carl Balsmer, and Diana Dawn. Wow. Thank you, everybody from everywhere. And uh, Ian, we have some great questions. Yeah, Linda, before we go to questions, can I just say uh, we are just 150 subscribers away from 202,000 subscribers. Yay! If everyone can please <laughs> like and subscribe. Great. I love you guys. Uh, if you are not a subscriber, uh, see that red arrow and uh, hit it uh, to subscribe. It doesn't cost you anything, but it helps us with our YouTube channel, Earth Files YouTube channel on uh, the, uh, in the network. And um, the likes, if you like what we're doing tonight and each week, uh, click on that like button. All of it uh, helps support us being able to do this. So I thank you very much. And we now are going to move to a wonderful section, some of your questions. And I'm going to begin with Moonbird, who always seems to be at the head of the Super Chats. And now, Brad, what we're going to do is alternate between the recordings and me uh, humbly trying to give some insights uh, to your really extremely good and challenging questions. So Brad, let's go to Moonbird. Happy Vernal Equinox, happy 200,000 subscribers. Hello, Linda, hello, Earth Files community, and welcome to all of the new members. I'm Moonbird, it's great to see all of you. My question relates to the little people, also known as the Fae, and by many other names around the world. Linda, do you have any favorite stories in world folklore or perhaps in your own research where the Fae and the little people may have intertwined and intersected? I'd love to hear it. Thank you for all that you have done for us and for me. You make our lives and this planet better. Up with light. Love you. Hi, Moonbird. I love your cosmic background <clears throat> and your question about fae or fairy little people. 
It made me think of a time back in the late 1989, I believe it was. I was working at CNN in Atlanta, Georgia, and I was working on an environmental program called EarthBeat. The executive producer was a friend of the movie actress, Shirley MacLaine, and they invited me to join them one afternoon to talk about UFOs, ETs, and high strangeness that Shirley herself had encountered and written about in her now famous book, Out on a Limb. That book by Shirley MacLaine provoked me so much that I used it to go to Peru in the spring of 1987 to explore several UFO ET locations as a follow-up to my own TV documentary, A Strange Harvest, about animal mutilations. And I used Shirley MacLaine's book to guide me on my Peru trip and during our discussion in Atlanta, Georgia, I was telling her about tall, red-haired humanoids that were well-known to Peruvians who lived in Pia Pinto, a very small, beautiful village in the Andes. I went there with a translator to interview several people in that village about the ETs that they had encountered face to face, and they knew all about a big, huge, round spacecraft that landed on the mountaintop above their village. I asked Shirley if she had ever encountered tall, red-haired beings in Peru when she was there for all the work that she did that went into her book. Interestingly, she said that she had not, but that the strangest beings that she had ever encountered were near Crestone, Colorado, where she was looking at property not to buy for a new house in the San Luis Valley, long famous for UFO sightings. Shirley said that she was standing on a hill top below the big mysterious Mount Blanca that rises high above the San Luis Valley when she heard little squeaking sounds and she looked down at her feet. And when she looked down, she said there were and she used the phrase, little people, only about 8 to 12 inches tall. And she said it was as if they had just somehow emerged from the ground around her feet. Shirley said she did not move her shoes, but suddenly she felt overcome by a warning, a sense of warning and a thought in her head, don't buy the land and move here. And that's why she did not. But she asked me, Linda, who are those little people? They are as real as you and me. And I will only add beyond our three-minute bell that the Crow Indians have in the prior mountains of Carbon and Bighorn counties in Montana have legends about little people about 18 inches high, knee high, and that there are uh, eyewitness stories from the crow about seeing these little tiny 18 inch high little people take down an elk and carry it off with such strength that the crow have been the for centuries they have been afraid to go into the prior mountains where the little people are known to dominate okay it's another earth mystery that has persisted for centuries. And for, if any of you know anything more about the little people anywhere around the world, please email me at earthfiles at earthfiles.com. And now, Brad, let's go to Vilma. Hello, dear Linda. This is Vilma from Austin, Texas. First of all, I'd like to thank you for creating this Earth Files YouTube channel for all the truth seekers out there. I have a two-part question. Given the current global situation, could this affect the possibility of getting the headline that we are not alone in the universe? Do the tall whites possess technology to neutralize a timeline to avoid a conflict or even World War III? Thank you. God bless you. Fluffy and chocolate. Cheers. Thank you, Vilma, very much for both of your questions. And 
I guess I'll start with what went into my mind as I was hearing you, that before the brutal violence of Putin in Ukraine, I had hoped the joint astronaut missions of the United States with Russia on the International Space Station would lead to bringing both nations and the whole world more together for space exploration. If we were in peacetime now, instead of the irrational Ukraine violence, the U.S., NATO, Russia, China, and other countries might agree that the whole world needs to be told the truth about other intelligences in the Milky Way galaxy and beyond in this universe, and that those, those other non-human intelligences do interact with Earth and have throughout human history. There is also the argument that finally telling all humans in all nations the truth, that we're not alone in this universe, that it is teeming with life and consciousness, that might shock humanity enough to stop fighting each other. It's a prayer of mine. Now, about tall whites having temporal technology that can alter timelines, I think the tall whites do have highly advanced time manipulation technology. In fact, I have been told they will not share that technology with Earth humans because of our tendency toward self-destruction. It has also been suggested to me that the tall whites are members of an intergalactic council or federation that makes decisions about when or if to interact with new or evolving life forms such as us on Earth. And that might be why we humans still have not been publicly introduced to tall whites and Nordics and others who are supposed to have a vested interest in our evolving away from tribalism and wars to real and sustained peace on earth. So the bell, I beat the bell. bell. <laughs> okay, let's. I got, I got a surprise for you. Pick up the headphones. Oh, headphones. okay, you guys. This is. Uh... It's Alan. Oh, great. If I can. Could... <laughs> I'm rubbing my head and my stomach Linda, and keeping going. You know, I always like introducing you as Alan. a national treasure because you are. You've brought now truth, intelligence, and wisdom to at least 200,000 people and more because of your dedication to understanding a phenomenon that is nearly incomprehensible. If anyone's going to do it, you are. Lots of love, and I'll see you soon. Oh, thank you, Alan so much. Uh, you are a dear friend and you are a, one of the brilliant synthesizers and uh, hopefully we'll talk also in the next week or two after the program. Much love to you. And I would like to have Brad move on with question number 13. Hi, uh, Linda. Thank you for your broadcast, your website with the archived reports and your books. I'm a subscriber and view the recordings of your broadcast. Thank you for allowing me to ask a question. How many astronauts that have walked on or orbited the moon have you interviewed? Thank you for that interesting question. It made me think back in a very interesting and fascinating time uh, in 1991, I was the concept creator and supervising producer of the TV series pilot UFO Report Sightings. During that production, I was based in Los Angeles at Paramount Studios, and Fox Network was going to air our pilot on, and did on October 17, 1991, to a very large audience, and we continued to be in production for five seasons on Fox. For that pilot, I did an on-camera interview with astronaut Gordon Cooper, who was the youngest of the seven original NASA astronauts in Project Mercury that made up the first human space program of the United States. Gordon Cooper told me that he had inside government information that there really were 
blonde, blue-eyed, extraterrestrial humanoids that were based on Earth. They were from another star system. He said they were referred to by people he knew as Nordics and that he, astronaut Gordon Cooper, had communicated face-to-face -face with a blonde Nordic. Now, for the sightings pilot that I was uh, producing, I also interviewed NASA astronaut James McDivitt, who flew in the Gemini 4 mission when astronaut Ed White performed the very first American spacewalk. Astronaut McDivitt later flew in Apollo 9 and became manager of NASA lunar landing operations and then the Apollo spacecraft program from 1969 to 1972 after astronaut Neil Armstrong's first human step onto the moon. During our sightings interview, astronaut McDivitt told me that he was taking photographs out the window of what I recall, I believe, was Apollo 9's 10-day flight on March 3 to 13 of 1969. That was the third human space flight in NASA's Apollo program. McDivitt told me that he saw a strange silver-colored object moving slowly by the spacecraft window. It had the shape of a tin can, but perfect, with a rod or antenna sticking straight out. He had no idea what it was, and he took many photos. And then, as soon as he was back on Earth, he went to a NASA photo lab and asked for his photos of the mystery object outside their spacecraft window. But astronaut McDivitt was told the photographs were classified. He was not able to see them. And since my TV program sightings was about UFOs, the implication was that the silver object with the projecting rod or antenna was not human technology but was related to the UFO phenomenon that had been highly classified by the U.S. government from World War II onward to this day, and the secrecy even applied to Apollo 9 astronaut James McDivitt not having the right to look at his own photographs taken during a NASA mission. And I'm now going to go to slide 14. And this is Ginny from Nova Scotia, Canada. Congratulations, Linda, on 200,000 viewers from Nova Scotia, Canada. My question for you is regarding your many travels and the places you've seen that had structures that clearly weren't made by humans. I was wondering which one you found the most intriguing and why. I was lucky enough to have my dream vacation to Egypt before COVID struck, and it was just amazing to me. So thank you very much and congratulations again. Thank you, Jenny, very much. And thank you for joining this 200,000 subscriber celebration. Like you, I was fascinated at the Cheops Pyramid in 1982 on a trip to Egypt. But the strangest archaeological site that I visited was Gobekli Tepe, eight miles northeast of San Lurfa, Turkey, only six miles from the southern border with Syria. I was there on June 13, 2012, as the sun rose, and I was standing on the hilltop above the archaeological dig site. It was carbon dated to 12,000 years ago. Gobekli is older than Egypt, Samaria, classical Greeks, and Stonehenge. Ramps had been built to walk around the excavated and mysterious 10 to 19 foot tall elegantly carved limestone pillars erected in circular patterns. Since 1994, only 5% of the pillar circles have even been uncovered. According to ground-penetrating radar, there might be at least 250 more standing pillars that form in 16 more circles still buried under an additional 22 acres of deep soil. Each pillar weighs 10 to 20 metric tons, and many are sculpted with odd, even unrecognizable animals, insects, and humanoid figures, that they are actually sculpted in the limestone. They aren't glued on, so that somehow the, the pillar and the creatures are all made in one huge limestone. 
German archaeologist Klaus Schmidt, PhD, began excavating layer by layer in 1994, and he never found any evidence of cooking hearths, houses, or trash pits. He also did not find tools that could explain how these extraordinary three-dimensional huge heavy pillars and sculptures were made. And sadly, Professor Schmidt's work was cut short by a heart attack. The day I was there on June 13, 2012, as the sun rose, I could see a little sunlight on the edge of one pillar, and I headed down to the wooden ramps so I could get closer. I expected to feel something intuitively from getting close to the pillars that would help me understand what Gobekli Tepe is. What would the purpose of all these 19-foot-tall limestone pillars placed in circular rings be? But even standing just a few feet from that pillar that had a touch of sun, I could not feel anything. It was like a vacuum surrounding me. What is Gobekli Tepe? What was it built for 12,000 years ago? And an even greater mystery. Professor Schmidt discovered that the entire Gobekli Tepe site had been deliberately buried under deep soil by something 11,000 years ago, as if protecting it from an outside force. And what happened 11,000 years ago? 30 species of mammals, such as saber-toothed tigers and woolly mammals, were killed to extinction by something from outer space that hit the North American side of Earth with violence and fire. Gobekli Tepe was saved by the soil that was put on all of the, the pillars. But what is Gobekli Tepe? Slide 15, Michael Monroe from Australia. Hi, Linda. Um, it's Mike from Australia. Um, thank you, thank you, thank you for all the hard work that you do. We really appreciate it. One thing I can't get my head around is the... Um, holographic universe. Does this mean that our lives are all predestined? Has somebody put us into a program? Love your work. Love you. Thank you very much. Mike, you're not alone in asking about are we in a holographic universe? It is for me one of the most interesting subjects and I don't feel that I know enough about it yet. I keep learning and reading. And so, so tonight I wanted to share a 2017 email exchange with a spiritual teacher that I think right now is at least a bridge from our not understanding what a holographic universe implies for us. And it begins, quote, you are referring to a recent scientific report proposing that the entire universe could be a, quote, vast and complex hologram, close quote. This means that our perception of reality may be just an illusion. The idea that reality as we perceive it is an illusion is not new and dates back to the ancient Hindu concept of Maya, in which all of material reality is an illusion. Even if you approach matter from a quantum point of view, what we see is a combination of our perceptual equipment and the interactions of atomic particle waves that are altered by the very act of being observed. In the hologram theory, a three-dimensional image is encoded in a two-dimensional surface, similar to a hologram on your credit card. In this case, the entire universe is encoded. And that does bring up the question of predestination. In the world of the spirit, there is no linear time as humans measure it. It is all one big simultaneous. As such, what has already happened, what is happening, and what will happen all coexist at the same time. We just can't see this due to limitations of the mind as a perceptual tool. So in that sense, yes, everything is predestined. But on the other hand, because it is a universe of infinite possibility, 
mutability changing and flowing. You can change the pre-existing pattern through exercising free will. The universe is not a stale, static, preformed thing. It is continually expanding and a growing field of energy and information with intention coming from your heart and your soul. You can impact your life by understanding the natural pattern of growth and expansion is the key law of the universe. Therefore, you are not the prisoner of a life in which you have no say. Free will is part of the miraculous lives we live in our creative interaction with universal forces. It is the way that we partner with this universe." Close quote. I really would like to interview a physicist or several about all the holographic questions for an upcoming Earth Files YouTube broadcast, a whole broadcast. And several of you are linking the holographic questions to what does a holographic universe mean for our souls? For example, here are questions from Shane Payne, slide 16. Hi, Linda. Shane here. You've covered quite a bit about the holographic universe, but I guess my question in relation to that would be, if this is a projection from another dimension, does that mean we are physically there but projected here? Or are we physically here but the world around us is essentially a hologram? If that's true, what is it designed to do? Also, what could that possibly mean for our souls in relation to how we think that they govern this universe? Thank you for everything you do. And Brad, I want you to also go on to slide 17, Caroline Boyce. Hi, Linda. This is Caroline from Pennsylvania. And I have two quick questions for you. One, what happens to our soul when we pass? I've been watching a lot of your programs about um, some of the people you interviewed about seeing people's souls transfer to another person. And then my next question is the booms. I was one of those people who heard the booms. My question is, I heard the booms two years ago where I lived and they were so loud, but other people didn't. And I didn't understand because it was so loud. Have you heard about this as well? Thank you so much. Thank you for you and your team. Appreciate it. Take care. I had Brad do these back to back because of uh, the questions concerning the soul back to back. And uh, Caroline added the question about the booms, which is really coming into the news again. Something extraordinary is happening on this planet. Homeland Security isn't addressing it at all in the United States anywhere. And yet uh, there are more and more media reports about loud booms that are being picked up news are carrying the headlines and nobody is uh, being able to answer what are they. And I'm going to start with the booms and then I'm going to go back uh, to the souls. The question, the, the booms have been going on in my records starting in January of 2011 to date. And one of the most fascinating that I began to realize between 2011 and 12 that I was getting interviews. I was doing so many interviews. If you went to my earthfiles.com website and you just typed in the search bar booms, you will see how many, probably a couple of hundred on booms. And I remember that I began getting a pattern from people, whether it was Canada, the United States, Mexico, Australia, where they would say, and I'm thinking of one particular case that answers uh, to some extent or expands on what Carolyn was saying about people hearing and not hearing. This was a man who uh, had a camera that was a, like a security camera, and they got a, a, a loud boom that they heard and that the whole family heard. It was uh, parents and children in a house. And 
he showed me and uh, we had the, the evidence of it. And I said to him in the interview, could you please go to your neighbors to your right and to your left on your side of the street and to the neighbors on the other side of the street and ask, and maybe what we can get would be a summary of people uh, and see who heard and how long and, and all of that. When he called me back, he said, Linda, I don't understand this. Uh, we, my whole family, we, the house shook. And he said, there isn't one neighbor, not to the right of me and not across the street, who heard anything. He said, I'm shocked. I assumed that everybody heard this. That particular description out of the going 2011 to 2022, it has happened so many times. Now, I've talked about this to some extent with um, Mark Wood, a retired Navy captain, who had called me about two or three years ago. He lives in Boca Raton, Florida. And he said, Linda, I have just experienced when people say it came from the top and it hit the side of the house and somebody else says, no, it came from below ground, cracked my foundation. He said, I was in the upper story. It clearly came from above, but it hit only one side of my house. I don't understand, but it was a compression wave. And uh, my hope is that for those of you listening tonight who may have experienced some of the recent booms that have occurred, uh, to get in touch with me, I would really like to do fresh interviews with people who are hearing these because something extraordinary has to be behind these because they're not explained by sonic booms, seismic signatures, none. So that now are the booms, and I will go to the soul, uh, combining something for all of you who ask me about how the holographic universe, or where do I think that the soul goes at the moment of death, uh, what is the role of souls in a holographic universe? I, I really am going to do a whole program and taking these in an evolutionary way with interviews. But what I'd like to share tonight on this special program. Remember, it goes back probably now about five years ago, four years ago, I guess. And... Uh, it was right at the beginning of my starting the Earth Files YouTube channel. And my dear, dear cat Simba died. And my brother came with me to the vet and I told the story of what happened, of how my, I asked my brother to take Simba because I knew he had to be put to sleep. And that was the night I knew he was sick and I was going to go to the vet, but I put him downstairs for, with some water because he wasn't eating and I didn't want him to have to climb stairs. And at four o'clock in the morning, almost dot on the clock, I heard scratching at the door. It literally woke me up. I opened the door and Simba, who had not been able to walk anywhere, the day before, was there at the door. And I gathered him up into my arms. I sat down on the bed with the light on, and I held him from 4 a.m. to 7 a.m., just holding him, feeling him with light purr, knowing that he was feeling terrible and that I was going to meet my brother at the vet at noon. And when my brother took Simba from me in the vet's office, I remember specifically looking into his eyes. And there was life. What is it that we recognize as life? There was life in his eyes. And in about two or three minutes, my brother walked back, carrying still Simba. 
and put him in my arms. And I said, where did you go? Because the eyes no longer had any life. Where does it go? How does it happen? What is the difference? The difference is the soul. That is the difference. You can take a hold of a leaf that is alive and then take a hold of a, li- of a leaf that is artificial. And you can feel life in the living leaf. You cannot feel it in artificial. That is the soul. It is vital. We humans have great souls. We should be honoring them. And when we have a pet who does what Simba did, I was in agony that night. I was in sheer agony of grief. And I must have fallen asleep because I knew it was after midnight when I was still in such anguish. Because on that clock, it was like 3.11, it was something like that, that I remember. I woke up, and I woke up seeing that my hands were in front of me pushing up on the mattress, the sheet, my legs behind me. I was in what I would call the cat pose in yoga. I don't know how this happened because I was not conscious of coming into this at all. I went to sleep in anguish. Where did you go, Simba? Those were my last thoughts. Where did you go? What is life? What is death? Where does the soul go? And as I am like this on my hands, I am looking right at where the headboard would be and above. And there was this big oval, maybe three or four feet high, it seemed to me, with blue, white, and yellow fiery flame sort of not flame, but, but energy, energy, yellow, white, and blue. And there was Simba. And the life was in his eyes. And I literally jumped and went, I'm going to take you back. I don't care. But as I did that, it just sort of dissolved away. And then I became really awake, and I realized that what I was seeing behind my dear cat that I was trying to grab, it looked like a spiral. It looked like something that was gray going like this. I have no idea, but it did seem to be a place, a structure, and that Simba, my dear, dear, dear furry soul cat, my Simba, came back to answer my question. Where did you go? Where does life go? Where does the soul go? And I'm sorry I'm feeling emotional tonight. I did not know that it would still bring back internal tears to share this again because a lot of you had not heard that story from long ago. But this to me to all of you who ask me questions about does a holographic universe mean what about souls? Where do souls go? I think that Simba, Simba gave me an education, even if I don't fully understand it, that at the moment of death on this planet, in this universe, we, Homo sapiens sapien, we have strong souls if we would just relate to them as the eternal part of our existence and that we go in and out of organic life. But that organic life persists with the presence of souls. The two are linked. God bless Simba wherever he is and my brother for helping me with him. I love you. Pick up and now... I'm bringing up Buddy. Oh. Uh, <laughs>
Buddy. Hello, Linda. This is Buddy, a.k.a. Psychic X. Just wanting to say congratulations. Thank you so much for your incisive and brave research into this field and reporting it with such dignity and professionalism. And congratulations on your 200,000 subscribers. You're the best. Love you. I love you too, Buddy Bolton. You are a gifted, gifted, gifted being. Thank you. Thank you for sharing your soul with all of us in all of your gift. And now let's go to our next. Hi, Linda. This is Nelson Armour in Pine Mountain, Georgia. I record natural radio signals. I'm curious, does ET want to be noticed when somebody like me has the recorder on or are they evasive? Thanks. Bye. I really appreciated your interesting question, uh, Nelson. And um, the one thing I wanted to say, my definition of uh, natural sources of radio waves, which you have been monitoring, would include, I think, radio noise produced by lightning and other uh, natural processes in the Earth's atmosphere, and astronomical radio sources in space, such as the sun, um, maybe even astronomical bodies, and that all warm objects radiate high-frequency radio waves, such as microwaves, as part of their black body radiation, and that that would be the world that you are uh, trying, uh, I think if I understood, that you're recording or listening to. But I don't personally know of a lot of reports or maybe not even a single report specifically in which somebody would be trying to record these natural sources of radio uh, waves and then end up with something coming into their recording that appeared to be intelligent as if something other than human was trying to insert something. So I thought uh, tonight in playing your question and my actually being puzzled about whether or not that has happened, uh, dear audience, if anybody has uh, knowledge of or has done something in which they have been trying to record natural uh, radio waves and something came in that you thought was actually intelligent information, whether binary or whatever it would be, uh, let me know at earthfiles at earthfiles.com. Uh, this is an interesting question and there might actually be a lot of people out there who have not talked about this and this would be interesting. So I throw it back to you guys and let's go on to uh, slide 19, Michael Sadler. Hi, Linda. Congratulations on 200,000 subscribers. Cheers. What an accomplishment. I enjoy listening to Earth Files while I am renovating an apartment. Uh, thank you so much for all the work that you do. I have questions for you. My questions are twofold. First, do you think that humankind has some sort of preference based on species similar to racism on Earth that may be driving us towards an affinity for the tall whites, the Nordics, etc. Do you think that they have the same biases towards different ethnicities of humankind? Thank you. Hi, thank you, Michael. Uh, those are difficult questions. And I think that what I thought when I was listening to your questions is remember in my interview with Lou Elizondo, 
when I described the Defense Intelligence Agency analyst meeting with me in December of 1999, in which he described our government knowing that there were three different extraterrestrial civilizations that had been in conflict over our planet Earth for at least 270 million years. And he described those three civilizations as being tall blondes that he referred to as Nordics as well, reptilian humanoids who may have a long time presence on this planet but are in conflict with these others that also include the gray beings that are both organic and are artificial intelligence. The DIA analyst said the three different species each wanted Earth for their own laboratory without competing with the others. What the analyst knew and what I have been shown in a government document are the words, quote, these extraterrestrial biological entities manipulated DNA in already evolving primates to create Homo sapien. But the document does not say which extraterrestrial or if all three of the competing extraterrestrial species for millennia are the ones that manipulated DNA to create Homo sapien. Is there one manipulator, two, three, five, ten, twenty, a thousand? And that goes to the heart of your question. Why are there five different races of Homo sapien? And if the DNA manipulators of life on Earth were fighting with each other over the past 270 million years, and each ET species has wanted this beautiful laboratory planet for themselves without competing with the others, does any intelligence know which human type resulted from which extraterrestrial DNA manipulation? It's a big question. Why is Earth so tribal? Why do we pit against each other? And now I'm going to go to question 21, Jeff, Jeff and Ellen Robbins in Daytona Beach, Florida. Hi, Linda. This is Ellen. I'm in Daytona Beach, Florida, and my husband Jeff is here with me. Also, he's my cameraman today, sir. First of all, do you have any insight as to the source of Elon Musk's vision of the future? We're pretty curious about that. Thank you for everything that you do. Bye. I'm interested in Elon Musk's vision of the future as well. Thank you for that question. In July of 2017, he told the National Governors Association, quote, the thing that drives me is that I want to be able to think about the future and feel good about that. And I can't think of anything more exciting than going out there and being among the stars. But Musk expresses his sincere worry about Earth's future. He thinks as we rely more and more on artificial intelligence, that AI could become an existential threat to human existence on Earth as more and more AI replaces human jobs and continues to evolve rapidly past normal human intelligences. And that year of 2017, KNBC News in Los Angeles quoted him in a big headline, Elon Musk thinks life on Earth will go extinct. And he is putting most of his fortune toward colonizing Mars, close quote. He said uh, recently that he now has about $15 billion to put into this transfer of people to a colony in Mars. And since the orbits of Mars and Earth only sync up every two years, he can't do the next flight trying to get people there until 2024. He says that his goal is to get a million people from Earth to Mars by 2050, 2050. And then he counts on the passengers to be the builders and the workforce on Mars. 
and it will have to be those first humans who also build fuel depots on Mars for two-way space travel between the red and the blue planets. He warns that humans moving to inhabit two planets he thinks is vital because he expects there will be one or more extinction events on Earth as there have been over the planet's 4.6 billion year history. But he puts out, points out that when humans finally step out onto the Martian red dusty ground, one of the first things they will miss is Earth's blue sky. Instead, the Martian sky is red during the day, but the sun rises and sunsets go blue. The first human colonizers will maybe find some fun because he points out, you will have gravity that is only about 37% of that on Earth, so humans will be able to lift heavy things more easily and even bound around, jumping more slowly in the air, close quote. Oh, I'd love to be on a trip like that. Now, let's go to question 22, Jennifer. Hello, Earth Files, and congratulations on your new milestone of over 200,000 subscribers. Linda, my question for you is in regards to a 2017 interview you conducted with Brian S., who was a naval officer that flew multiple flights in the Antarctica in the mid to late 1980s. Is there an update as to what became of the 12 to 15 scientists that clearly experienced high strangeness while on assignment in Marie Birdlin? Since decades have passed, I'm wondering if any of them have stepped forward to share what they might have encountered, or have we heard any stories being passed along through family members as to what happened in the Antarctica. Thank you so much for producing such fantastic content in a place where all of us curious minds can join each week to learn about intriguing topics. Much peace and love to all who are watching. Cheers. Hi, and cheers to you. I'll raise the glass from earlier. And cheers to everybody who sent questions. Uh, cheers to Ian and Eric and Brad who have helped me do this. Uh, cheers that we may be celebrating another one of these in a few months uh, as we continue to grow. And I want you to know that I did talk with Brian S. about your question. And he told me that he, well, we had both, we had expected and hoped that somebody from the National Science Foundation group of scientists that disappeared or one of his crew might have more information. But he said that to date, even though he's tried and reached out to a lot of people, he has never learned anything more about what happened to those 1315 National Science Foundation scientists at the camp and Marie Bird land that literally disappeared for nearly two full weeks. And he was in the C-130 crew that took them there, that went hunting for them. And then when they got the signal that the scientists were suddenly back and he's in that crew and they went back and they were expecting scientists to become running to them with some huge tail. They were all lined up. They were all looking down at their feet. The C-130 pulls up, not a word, not a conversation. They get into the C-130 silently, still looking down. At one point, Brian, he got in a jump seat. The plane is getting ready to take off. The engines are going. And he said one of the male scientists sat down on a jump seat this way and facing Brian. And Brian said, he reached over and touched the man's knee. And the, the scientist never even looked up. And he said, what in the world traumatized those scientists? We still don't know. They were taken all out of Antarctica. All of their equipment was taken to Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in the United States. And if Brian, 
had not told me that story, and I've used it in Ancient Aliens, and here uh, we wouldn't know. But something traumatized those scientists. And it might, it might have been a base of non-humans there under the ice. On that note, the thousands of mysteries. Earphones. Earphones? Oh. Got Jimmy Church. Oh, my gosh. Congratulations, Linda. It seems like every day I'm celebrating another Linda Moulton Howe milestone. 200,000. Wow. And wow. I guess uh, I need to video the 300,000 <laughs> milestone later on today after I finish drinking this champagne in celebration of you. Linda, congratulations. And uh, for everything that you do, on behalf of everybody of this community, uh, thank you so much for everything that you do. This is Jimmy Church of Fade to Black saying, Linda Moulton Howe rocks. <laughs> I love you, Jimmy Church. And I did drink while your recording was going. And here's one more cheer. And we're going off the air until next Wednesday. I love you guys. I really do. Turn on closed captions for YouTube videos by clicking the white CC button on the lower right. The default language for Linda's videos is English. If you would like to see the captions in another language, click on the white Settings button next to the CC button. Select Subtitle CC and then select Auto Translate. Select a language and the captions will now appear in that language sort of gone through and they will hold their heads. I never had a cat do that before. And they'll pull against the comb, helping me get out snarls. And I think it's the best they've ever been.